All right, so the objectives for this lesson, which is about what would have been one class session back in the before times, is to define and determine what the uh, solution, solvent, and solutes. We're going to learn about concentration as a way to specify amount, and we're going to determine the nature of the species present in an aqueous solution. So let's get to it. All right, so this corresponds to chapter four, reactions and aqueous solutions. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple of different things here. So the broad outline is that we're going to talk about the dissolution process. Um, ionization, so in some cases, a lot of the chemistry we're going to talk about here involves um, ions in solution. And we're going to talk a lot about how they get there. And in particular today, or what would have been today, talk about one of three classes of reactions, precipitation reactions. All right, solutions, why? So far, we've been really just talking about pure substances, which wasn't explicitly stated, but there it is. And it turns out that there's a, some problems with reacting pure substances together, and it's something that isn't often done. Usually, um, the chemist would like to do a couple of things. Um, lower and at least control the concentration or number density of the reactants. Um, it also helps if you can evenly disperse the products and reactants. And for the reaction to occur smoothly and as completely as possible, we generally want to make sure that the reactants are effectively mixed because if you don't mix the reactants, they will not turn into products. And solutions solve all of these problems. Now, and they do so by evenly dispersing the solute um, into a solvent. And those are actually the two parts of a solution, um, solvent and solute. And there could be more than one solute. This could be plural. What's the distinction? It's a lot simpler than you might think. The solvent is the thing that is present in the greatest amount or the greatest quantity. And the solute or solutes is everything else. And I will say that usually there is a fairly large dis, um, disparity between the amount of solute and the um, amount of solvent. Usually the solvent, there's much more of the solvent than of the solute. Now, a lot of what we're going to be talking about in this chapter um, is we have to learn about what actually, what are the species that are reacting are. And in a lot of cases, that happens to not be what an experimenter actually put into the solution, especially when water is the solvent, which is going to be the case for this chapter. So the first question we want to ask ourselves is, does the presence of the solvent change the solute, either physically or chemistry? chemically? And the answer is it depends. Um, some solvents are chosen specifically so that that does not happen. And some solvents are chosen that it actually does. Water is a very common solvent because it is you know, common on Earth. But it is also one that has a significant influence on the solutes. It actually does change them or affect them. And sometimes that's good. And a lot of chemists actually avoid water like the plague as a solvent because of that. And so basically, we want to ask ourselves, you know, on the molecular level, how strong are the interactions between the solvent and the solute? And especially in the case of water, people discuss this for a while, and it turns out that electrical conductivity gave us quite a bit of insight on this. And before I show you the next slide with the, and I use the term loosely, experimental results, uh, we need to talk about what makes something electrically conductive. And the answer is the presence of mobile charges. Now, in the case of the electrical conductivity that you are most familiar with, electrical current being carried through a copper wire, the mobile charges there are actually electrons that are free to move throughout the entirety of the piece of copper. 
And in solution, in aqueous solutions, so solutions where water is the solvent, get used to that word aqueous, the mobile charges can be ions. So not just electrons, but ions have charges too, so they can induce electrical conductivity. So here's the setup. So this is a marginally safe conductivity detector. Uh, what this is, is uh, this is a power connection right here. There is one electrode going into the solution, another one going dipped into the solution, and then that goes to the um, this light bulb and then back to ground or whatever. Um, so if this solution in which the electrodes are dipped is conductive, this is a complete circuit, current will flow and the light bulb will light up. And if it is not conductive, this is an open circuit and current will not flow and the light bulb does not light up as it is here in this first frame. So a couple of things to say. First of all, um, contrary to what you might think from being warned about this in everyday life, pure water, and the word pure here is actually pretty important, is actually a fairly poor conductor, is a very poor conductor of electricity. Um, in fact, the device that we use in our labs to generate purified water, that's how it tells us um, if it's working or not, if the water is coming out too conductive. Um, now, it turns out that, and this is not in the frame, but also pure sodium chloride does not conduct electricity. Now we've talked about these things enough to know that if this is NaCl, you know this is an ionic compound, so it is made up of charged particles. But in the solid form, they are not mobile. So pure NaCl does not conduct electricity. So you can embed these electrodes in a beaker full of salt crystals or one giant chunk of salt and that also will not conduct electricity. But you put just a pinch of salt and you don't need to dump the whole container like this figure would have you believe. Really, literally a pinch um, turns that solution into a very, very conductive solution um, as, a as shown here by the fact that the light bulb is now lit up. So these two things that by themselves do not conduct electricity when combined do. So some change, there's been some interaction between the two that allowed for the production of mobile charge carriers, namely the sodium ions and chloride ions. And a solution such as this that conducts electricity or a substance like sodium chloride that when dissolved in water produces ions is called an electrolyte and the solution will be electrically conductive. And I should note, also not in the frame here, um, if you have the ability to get the sodium chloride hot enough so that it melts, you no longer have a regular lattice or a very highly regularly ordered solid that keeps the ions in a very locked into place. In the liquid form, the ions are actually mobile and liquid sodium chloride is also a pretty decent conductor of electricity uh, without the water. Um, but you also have to get it pretty hot to do that. And so let's talk about, you could do the same experiment here, this middle frame with sucrose. So this is table sugar. Now the table sugar dissolves in water about as well as the salt does. But even though that substance is dissolved, that solution remains non-conductive. So there's some interactions that allows the solid, um, the sugar crystals to be broken up, but ions are not produced in this process. Here, the solid is broken up and ions result. So let's talk about that. And so let's talk about what's making this happen here. And this is water. And water is a different molecule, or it is special. This is the electron cloud version of what 
a water molecule might look like from a distance. This red shaded area here indicates where you've got a lot of electron density. This is what that negative sign here implies. This little funky looking D, that is a lowercase Greek delta. And that is indicative of an area of excess negative charge, but not like a full on fundamental charge units worth of excess negative charge. And over here, you've got in this blue shaded area, some areas of excess positive charge. Now this arises from the fact that these electrons here that are shared between the hydrogen atom, the black dot here, and the oxygen atom, the black dot here, they're not shared equally. The, elect the oxygen is sort of an electron hog. So they end up st around the oxygen more, which is why they have a, a somewhat excess negative charge. Now, and this happens for both bonds. So these bonds are not equally shared, which means that there is a dipole moment from each bond. There's a partial positive charge around the hydrogen, partial negative charge on the oxygen. And if you are more than one or two molecular distances away, what you see from this is the sum of these two um, dipole vectors, something like this. So the, from a distance, the water molecule seems like it's got a partial negative charge on the oxygen and an area of partial positive charge dead center between the hydrogens, or sometimes we pretend they're actually on the hydrogens themselves. But the fact of the matter is that this has a, and water has um, among the largest dipole moments of a, lot of, of a lot of covalent molecules. And that's because the oxygen is just such an electron hog and the hydrogen is, um, does not resist very well either. It's not able to hold on to the electrons very strongly itself. So the sharing is, is pretty lopsided.